All right, everyone, I have started the recording. So good morning. Today is Wednesday, February the 7th, and welcome to our latest installment of the Aperio Teaching and Learning Meetings. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm from the University of Virginia. I'll be helping to facilitate this meeting today along with Neil Caden and others. We're very excited to have Jennifer Laudiana from Walsh University, who is going to talk to us about some of the LTI integrations that Walsh is using with Sakai and how those things have helped their institution. Before we do that, we wanna take a few minutes as we always do to dive in and have some preliminary announcements. Neil often is very generous and comes on the mic and takes us through a number of things that he's aware of. Neil, do you wanna go ahead and kick that off and talk about some of the announcements that are on your radar? Sure, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cough, <coughs> apologies. Um, so, uh, first of all, I don't think, I don't see Louisa on the call, but I am pretty sure that the Atlas, uh, group is taking nominations for, uh, for the Atlas Awards for Teaching and Learning. Um, that's a pretty important one. I also believe they may need some additional members. I don't think, I believe Louisa is not going to be available to participate and lead that group anymore. So those are two important Atlas related announcements. Um, and if she comes on, maybe she can provide more details. Um, Sakai 12.0 uh, is scheduled to come out at the end of February. We still need have a lot of work to do, though, on it. So it may be a little bit of a stretch goal, but we're converging towards a good date pretty soon. Um, we have Sakai documentation, help documentation that has to be completed. Some blocker issues are still out there, and we still need more QA testing but we're getting closer and so we're targeting the end of the month for sakai 12 and then we'll turn around and try and work on sakai 12.1 by the way am i sounding okay uh in terms of my mic very nice your, neil. your mic sounds good neil i can tell that maybe you're feeling just a little under the weather so i'm sorry to hear that but your mic sounds good okay thanks great um also um, Sakai Camp, we're, we're probably going to, well, I will be announcing soon a presentation uh, on February 22nd, Thursday at 1 p.m. to give an overview of uh, what happened at Sakai Camp. So if you're interested in that, you might want to mark your calendars. Um, and we think if there's anything else. Uh, I can't think of anything else at the moment unless there's uh, unless there are questions. And while folks are thinking about whether they have questions, I do have just a little bit of additional information from Louisa that she sent in an email message to Tricia and me today. So just adding on to some of the things that Neil has already talked about. One of our topics for our next teaching and learning meeting on Wednesday, February the 21st is going to be a discussion of Atlas and how some schools like Marist have used Atlas to really expand their innovation in the teaching and learning space and how they would like to continue that expansion throughout the larger Aperio community. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you've been thinking about maybe participating in that Atlas process a little bit more, uh, Louisa and also Julian Sharp, who is her director at Marist, are gonna be presenting some additional information on that. So that's two weeks from today, Wednesday the 21st, there'll be a presentation and also time for some Q&A. So be sure to join us for that. And Neil, Jennifer has a question in the chat about the date for the Sakai camp discussion. Um, that will be uh, February 22nd, which is Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we're gonna break it okay, up. Okay, great. Is yeah. there any... Go ahead. Neil, I think that just might have been somebody getting on the call who had an unmuted mic. So if you had some other things you wanted to add on there, just go ahead. No, I, think that, I think that covers it. So I think you heard the date, February 22nd, Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll record, we will record it. That's great. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, Jennifer, for posting that in the chat. So for any folks who are joining in and might notice that in the chat, that we are going to have a discussion and recap of Sakai Camp, and that's going to be Thursday, February the 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern time. 
So thanks so much, Neil, for chiming in with those announcements. Any other announcements from other folks or questions before we dive in and talk a little JIRA of the week? We had a JIRA of the week request, and I think we might have a couple minutes just to talk about that before we dive in. Okay, so we had a request from Ben to talk a little bit about Lesson Builder 905, and Ben has been helpful enough to post the link to the Sakai Project JIRA for that JIRA in the chat. So, Ben, I know this is an issue that you all are interested in at Illinois State, something you all are thinking about addressing, but you'd like to get some community input before you do that. Um, so, uh, go ahead, and if you're ready, chime in and tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this one at this point. Sure. Um, so essentially, um, I've just discovered that if you have it set up so that a student has to complete an assignment on, or excuse me, a page in lessons, um, they can get assigned a score, but there's no way to assign a zero for that. Um, Matt Jones has been kind enough to propose two different ways that he would recommend doing that, and I just really wanted to get the community's input on how they think it should be handled. Um, whether, you know, to continue the functionality as though it is native, like how other tools operate, or um, how would they expect it to operate. So if you guys want to take a second to read that, I think that'd be the best bet, probably. So it looks like in the original JIRA Lesson Builder 905, Matt has posted a couple of possible solutions here. He says, the only solutions I can think of are, one, change the way Lessons works with Gradebook and allow it to associate with an existing item, maybe is the only option. So the grade can be edited in the Gradebook. So that's solution number one. Or two, have some button plus a method in Lessons to assign the score of zero for all users who haven't completed on that page, which, if you're familiar with other tools like the Assignments tool, is a feature that we see elsewhere. And he adds a comment there, I believe, though, this would prevent them from getting any other score. And then he concludes that with, it would be nice if all these scores were specifically editable, but that seems like a feature far beyond either of these. So thanks, Ben, for posting those comments in the chat as well, so folks who aren't looking at the actual JIRA can see those comments if they want to read through them. If my melodious voice was not enough to capture everything that was being said there. So I see some comments in the chat. Uh, Dave has commented that they've used this feature a bit, um, and it's similar to the problem of use of the question feature. What do you do when a student doesn't engage or answer the question? And then Dave follows up, does the set null entries to zero in the gradebook feature work to set these to zero as well? Have you all done any testing of that, Ben? Have you noticed that at all? I have not. Um, but I believe... Um <clears throat> Excuse me, let me jump in here since um, I've also looked at this. Because this item is coming from another tool, the gradebook um, item is locked, and so you don't even get the option to set null entries to zero in the gradebook. It's like for tests and quizzes, um, that item, that option doesn't even appear. <clears throat> And Charles, is that true in the old classic gradebook and also in NG? Have you all been playing with NG yet? Have you experimented with that this, as well? This is in NG. Okay, this is in NG. Gotcha. We're not running NG fully in our instance yet, so I just wanted to make sure I understood exactly what you guys were talking about. Thank you. <clears throat> And Tricia has placed a comment in the chat that she uh, would vote for option number two, so have a button and a method in lessons to assign a score of zero. And she's also commented in the JIRA to that effect. So thank you, Tricia, for taking the time to do that and also reminding all of us that, you know, as Neil always says, when we do a JIRA Palooza, it's really important for everybody who has comments, questions, feedback on these JIRAs to actually comment in the JIRAs themselves so that we see those comments and we can engage in that discussion and use the strength of the community there to think a little bit about what we'd like to do. Uh, Dave also comments in the chat that he would vote for option number one, um, but that option two would probably be more economical. 
And Amy has asked a question, if we could take a step back, um, are we curious as to what the use case would be uh, for using this feature? And I'll let other folks chime in and answer that a little more fully, Amy. I would suggest that as Dave kind of hinted at earlier in his chat comments, the use case is probably for when there are certain assignments that are done and students have not engaged in those assignments, even though they're required. And the fact that they did not engage and complete them needs to be factored into their grade. Um, and there may not be an easy way to do that right now. And Dave adds a comment in the chat, students who are awarded points due to visiting the page um, and providing a means by which students can work through content at their own pace. Um, so for courses that are a little more asynchronous, maybe module based courses, things like that, um, you have to have a way to kind of monitor uh, that progress and as Trisha points out, be graded for it or for not doing it in this case, maybe. Right, there might be content on the page such as viewing a video or or looking at doc, excuse me, documents that the instructor might want to give some kind of incentive slash credit for for you know, just looking at those items and giving a, a grade for the page is one way to do that. <laughs> yeah, Charles, I definitely agree. I think that's exactly right. And I think Tricia is pointing out quite rightly that there needs to be a way to manually assign a grade either in lessons or in the grade book. Any other thoughts uh, from you, Ben, or you, Charles? Um, about this year or any other questions or comments from other folks. Again, please uh, add all of your comments and thoughts. If you continue to think about this and have other things that you want to add, please add those to the JIRA uh, so that we can see that discussion there and get even more feedback from the community there. And Dave points out uh, this would be a problem too. Uh, because if these students can't be awarded a zero, then the fact that they haven't completed the work won't affect their overall grade. And I think that's right. I think that's probably the, the main issue here that unfortunately students don't always do what they're supposed to. I mean, I know that's a shocking thing, but they don't always do what they're supposed to. And so we have to have a way to uh, monitor that. And Mark comments that his vote is for option one as well, uh, though the need for this is rare re-nullifying scores in the case uh, that a student is being provided an exemption uh, can be critical uh, for final grades and calculating those correctly. So thanks for that feedback, Mark, also. And Dave comments a plus one there for Mark. So thank you all so much for taking a couple minutes uh, to give some feedback here. Uh, ben, Charles, are you guys satisfied with this feedback thus far? Anything else you want to bring up before we move on? Uh, nothing on my end. Charles? I'm good. <clears throat> okay, sounds good. Well, in that case, we will go ahead and hand things over to Jennifer. Jennifer, I see your screen right now. So your screen sharing is already up and running. And so we welcome uh, Jennifer Laudiana from Walsh University, who's going to give us a presentation uh, called Putting It All Together, How Walsh Uses LTI Integration to Make Sakai, or their version of Sakai, a one-stop shop for online students. So thank you so much, Jennifer, for taking the time to do this for us. We're looking forward to it and take it away. All right. Thanks, Matt. You can still hear me. I just want to make sure I unmuted. You sound great. Okay, great. Um, so I presented this at the virtual conference in November. Um, so I'm going to walk through the presentation, but I also altered it because we've added tools since then, and we've also upgraded to 11. So I have some notes about that as well. <clears throat> um, as Matt said, my name is Jennifer Laudiana. I'm the Director of User Support and Classroom Technology here at Walsh University. Uh, we are located in North Canton, Ohio, which is about an hour south of Cleveland. We were founded in 1960 by the Brothers of Christian Instruction. 
And we have approximately 2,500 to 3,000 students, and that's undergraduates and graduates. And then we also have an adult um, learner program where adults can come back and finish their undergraduate degrees. Um, we have three fully online programs, our Master's of Business Administration, which has three tracks, our Master's of Science in Nursing, which has three different uh, areas you can specialize in, and then the Master's of Arts in Education. And then we are working on bringing our Bachelor's of Business Administration online and then our RN to BSN online. So we've kind of, with bringing those on, that kind of spurred us to do a couple of new things. So just a little bit about our instance. We are hosted with Longsight. Uh, we are currently on version 11.4. Uh, we just upgraded in December between fall and spring semester from 10.7 to 11.4. Uh, myself and our director of e-learning manage and work with faculty as well as our Sakai instance, which we renamed to ECN. So if I switch back and forth to that, you'll know that's the same thing. So what kind of started this is we want to make sure we have kind of a one-stop shop so students can find what they need for class if it's an external source within their course in ECN. So we expanded marketing for some of our online programs. So we have a company that's helping us broaden the marketing. And so that kind of spurred us to think about that because we have students that could be out of our area. So they can't just pop in and take a quiz or if they haven't, you know, find something or, or do paperwork. Um, or they also needed a way for them to access tools that they'll need. So for assessment, in our Higher Learning Commission, we have to put in artifacts, so we needed a way for them to do that a little easier, as well as buy books and some other things that I'll show you. Um, and also students were asking for things. Um, they wanted access without having to go to a different website. So one of the solutions was to use the LTI solution, the Learning Tools Interoperability, and we had some things integrated, so we had Big Blue Button, Turning Technologies, and those were actually integrated, and Longsight helped us put those in. Um, the nice thing about the LTI is that we can do that ourselves. It doesn't require um, having anything on the server side. We can use the tools that exist in ECN, and we can set them up pretty easily. And I set most of them up, and I'm not a programmer and don't use the server, so that makes it nice for me. Uh, when we decide if a vendor has an LTI implementation, which I'm finding more and more do, because faculty will come to us and say, can we put this in ECN? So I'll contact the vendor. Oh, yes. And they'll send us the URL, the secret, and the key. They'll also send us any special parameters or anything we need to send them. And I'll show you the screens um, as I'm going through here. And once we enter that, it's through the external tools and the administrative interface. Then we can test and tweak it. Um, we try, test it a little bit, and then we're done. So there's no technical skills, no programming. Um, it's a pretty nice interface. So to access it, you would be on the administrative site in Sakai, and you would go to external tools and then tools available in the system. And then previously we did add LTI 1.1 tool. Uh, most of ours are 1.1. Um, in version 11, I noticed there is a new tab for uh, putting in 2.x tools. So if there's tools that need that, and it looks like if we want to do that, we can get that set up on the server. So um, I just wanted to point that out as, as technology moves forward and folks may have 2.x, we can get those to work as well in version 11. So this is what it looks like. I'll kind of walk through the fields uh, just so you can get an idea. Um, the site ID, so if you have a tool, maybe a certain instructor only wants it on, on their particular class. So due to licensing or something like that, we have um, some videos that we set up for nursing and they are only available to nursing 614, which is the course that they're licensed to for that many people. So in that case, I would enter the site ID and I would um, go from there. Uh, most of our tools are global. Um, so the site ID, actually, I leave empty so that everyone sees the tools. 
Um, that's how majority of them work. Um, you can put in the tool title, what you want to call it, what you want the button to appear as. So I actually have um, some EBSCO reading lists from the library. And I actually have it, the tool is EBSCO Curriculum Builder, but the button text is reading list because that the student wouldn't know what EBSCO was, but the faculty member would if they're choosing that tool. Uh, then you can put in your description, the status of your tool. Um, is it enabled? Is it disabled? So if you have things maybe that um, aren't quite fully licensed yet, or if you have something that people aren't using or you discontinued, you can either remove it or disable it and then re-enable it later. Most of ours are all enabled. I haven't had to disable anything. So as we scroll down the page, um, the next section is the visibility. Um, this is where you put in, as I mentioned, the launch URL, which you'll get from your vendor, the launch key, and then they'll give you a secret. And I actually had one vendor, I had to create my own key and secret. So um, they could do that. But other than that one vendor, I have actually just done whatever they give me. Um, you don't want to allow any of these to be changed. Uh, by anyone. So I always keep them as do not allow. And the instructions from the vendor will also give you some of these settings so you can follow what they have. Um, frame height is custom and then the privacy settings are custom. It depends on the vendor. So for example, a couple of our tools use an email address and we have to send it over. So we would check um, send email addresses to external tool. Or if they're using the username, which we have some that do that, some use both. Um, so again, that's the vendor will kind of help you tweak that and what they need to get from you when it goes over to the tool. Um, services, this depends on if the vendor, if you need it. So providing the roster, allowing grading, um, our atomic learning tool, which I'll show you, does have a grading feature. It's a little bit... Um, it's not as easy as I thought it would be to use, and I'll talk about that, but it does, it can return grades to gradebook. Um, and then you can allow them to use lessons and store the setting data. And this particular screen is what you see in version 10. Um, I'll show you on the next screen, but this is what was in version 10. So if you are on version 10, you would see these options here, and it's a little bit shorter, and then you would save. If you're on version 11, you actually will see now the services, but then there's a section here of more items you can use. So we haven't used it, had to use any of these selections yet um, for any of the new vendors we've put on, and I haven't gone back and looked to see if any of the other vendors might need these, but everything seems to be working, so we've left them all unchecked for now. But that is additional, that list there. And then in the bottom, you can choose how it launches, if it goes into a pop-up and a new tab, or if it stays in the page, and then you have a debug option there as well. And then at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's custom parameters. We do have a few that might have you put in like your key code, so they can tie it to your instance or license um, and, I, and I had one vendor where I had to put something in in order for it to work on the Chrome browser. So like I said, the vendor works with you really well. I've never had any problems with the vendor. They're happy to help and it's been a pretty good process. And like I said, this is what it looks like in version 11. It's a little bit longer and it has the new section there. So what are the tools we have integrated? So I've talked about a few. Um, Atomic Learning, which has now changed its name to Who Knew It. Um, I kind of use them interchangeably. Uh, Barnes & Noble, we've done their purchase for books for students, and we're in the process of doing the textbook adoption for faculty. Um, the EBSCO host I mentioned, this is so students can access ebooks and videos right in their course. And the nice thing is it shows you statistics as an instructor. You can see who accessed it, what they accessed it, accessed, how many, um, how much they read. There's some statistics, and I'll show you an example of that as well. Um, our turning technologies clickers registration we have in there. Our assessment, which is task stream, I talked about loading artifacts. Um, the student can load it into their assignment and then they can click on task stream and load it into their um, section that they need, whether it's for a program or whether it's for a particular uh, major 
they can set that up. Um, Zoom video conferencing we have, um, that is working. Um, when I talked about this in November, if you were here, it didn't work quite right, but we figured out, I believe someone mentioned this, if you, in your account, when you set up the meetings, you have to turn off, you have to turn on, set, enable, join before host, because otherwise no one can go in the room until the instructor opens it. Um, so that's helped with that as well. And then the last thing I mentioned, the nursing videos. Um, those are Elsevier videos we use for nursing, um, the Mosby's um, videos, and they use them for physicals. Um, it's for our nurse practitioner program. Um, since November, we've actually added two more tools. Um, we've added our idea evaluations, which the first group is using them this week. So um, based on our testing, everything should be good, but I will probably touch base. One of the groups is my class. Um, that I teach, and so I'll probably touch base with them and see if they use the link from ECN and if they were able to get in smoothly and everything worked well. Um, the second one is a tool called Perusal. We have an instructor who wanted to use that. Um, the only trouble we had is she used it previously outside of ECN, so the students set up their accounts previously, and some of them use different email addresses instead of their Walsh email. Uh, so when they went in here, it had conflicts. It was like, you already have an account, or it created a new one, so they couldn't see their old information um, through ECN. So now she said for the next fall semester, um, she'll make sure that they go directly through ECN, and it'll cross over and create an account for them. Um, so that's the only thing that we had with that, is they had used the tool previously, and then she wanted to integrate it because it has some great book features that she wanted to use. So just to look um, what the tools look like, this is an, a picture of our 11 instance. Uh, one of the things I do like actually with 11 is on the right side of the screen, you'll see you can add the icons, the little favicon. So if you don't want it to default to the little world, or if you want to make it the little arrows or something different to distinguish them, especially if you have like in this example, I have five different tools on there. Um, it makes it kind of nice. So that's something new in 11. When you add the tool, you can set up the icon for that too. And I think that's true for any tools, but um, for the LTI, they always defaulted to the same icons. So this is atomic learning or who knew it. So when the instructor goes in and adds it, it actually will add it on the left-hand side. They will click on it and it will open up and they can search and find their videos they want the student to view. Once they've done that, you'll see that they have check marks on each section. So for the getting started, um, they've checked they need to use all of those. And then you'll also notice in this particular tool, they have assessments that you can use. Um, the assessments, you can see the individual scores on the Atomic Learning Who Knew It side. If the student completes the entire tutorial, then it will import a average of all of the scores into your grade book. So that's kind of a little different. Um, and in my example here, I used it for my class and I did not have all the tutorials for the students. So I have to go in and look at my assessments in the Who Knew It tool instead because um, I didn't allow them to look through all of them because some of the things we aren't covering. But there is an edit, so you can go in and edit it. So if you put it in and for my class in Excel, I will go in and say, this is chapter one and two's content. And then when we cover chapter three, I'll go and add that content so that they're kind of building as they go if they use the tutorials. Um, you can also choose to add the assessments or not. And then once you're done, you hit submit. And then the student will actually see it like this. So they don't see all the check marks. They just see the items you've chosen. They can see, they can click on them, the videos open, and then they can watch them. So, and then all of the data for this is tracked within um, Atomic Learning, the Who Knew It tool. So I can go in and look at reports. The instructor can go in and look at their assignments that way. So the EBSCO, this is what the instructor sees. So they can go in and add items to the reading list. They can import from an old list. So if they do a class and then they want to imp just keep using the same list, they can import it. They can also add to that imported list. So in this example, you can see two students accessed my list 
And then you can see at the bottom, the first one here, one student has clicked on this reading. So you can kind of manage a little bit um, how much students are using it or not. You can encourage them if they're required. Uh, you can see if they've used it and you can go from there. You can also add as the instructor instructions for them. You can add folders. You can kind of customize your page too. And then the student comes in and they just see all the readings in order. So they can just click on them. It'll tell them at the bottom here, you'll see one is full text and a PDF. Um, the top one, they need to request through interlibrary loan. Um, they can go ahead and reserve a book and retrieve it. Um, I do have an instructor who uses this every semester in the class, and it's actually an ebook, and it opens and they can read it online. So instead of having them go out and purchase it, they can use this tool as well. The Barnes & Noble purchasing, uh, the one thing to be aware of is this is per class. So if it shows up in your class, it's going to pull the information from that class and then bring up the textbook and then they can just order. If they don't have an account with Barnes & Noble, it will prompt them to create an account. Um, so that's how that works. Um, this is nice because we do have a lot of uh, students who take one class at a time. And so they might want to just buy the book for that class instead of going to the bookstore and buying all of them at the same time. So this is nice for them. If the instructor allows them to do this, they can do that. Um, task stream is what we use for assessment. Um, for some of our programs, you can see in this example, uh, general education, and then our one of our communication classes that uses it for portfolios. Um, if you don't have an account, it will automatically prompt you to register, so right within the tool. So you'll click on it in ECN, it opens, you're not registered, gives you the pages, and then it directs you right through. If you have registered, it'll actually take you straight to your home page on TaskStream, and you can click on it and submit it. So it makes it a lot nicer. Uh, we were sending students out to a separate browser, separate URL. They had to open it, go through the process of finding it, and this makes it really easy for the student. Um, last semester, we started using it, and it got it was pretty good feedback. Um, the only problems we had was students didn't have the right registration codes, uh, so we've kind of made that more obvious to them this time. Elsevier videos, this is what they would look like. So they open it, it comes up, they click on the videos, and then they can go through the series right away. So they don't need to go out and go to the Elsevier site. Uh, Zoom. Zoom will open in ECN and then it actually launches Zoom for you on your computer. Um, it requires the instructor to have a Zoom account and then it also requires them to send, keep, uncheck that enable login before host. So they need to make sure they check that and make sure this, that the students can get in before the host is there. Um, when that's When they don't allow that, what happens is the students can't get into it at all. Um, it doesn't open well, so we've figured out if they do that, then the students can get in a lot easier. And this is our new one, idea evaluation. So this automatically logs you in and brings up your evaluations. Um, I didn't have any, but this is what the screen looks like. It opens in a new tab for them so they can see it on the one side and keep their course open. Uh, so I'm curious to see how well this works um, this semester. I think it'll be really nice for our online courses. Uh, in person, they're usually in class, and then they can um, instruct them uh, from there. But in online, you usually have to communicate by email messages, uh, things like that. So having it there on the left, they should be able to do it pretty easily. And then the last one is a tool called Perusal. Um, if you go to perusal.com, um, it'll tell you about it. This is a screen. I just did this this morning. So when I click on the link, it shows you at the top that my account was created from Sakai. So it automatically created an account. So if I was in a class and my instructor had information here, I'd be able to see it, work on it. And then as long as she'd linked them up correctly in ECN, the grades would go back and forth for her. So that is all I had. Are there any questions? So thanks, Jennifer, for that great presentation. This is really interesting, a great chance to see just some of the many tools that might be available to us through LTI integration. There's been some great discussion in the chat and some questions there, so maybe we can start by going through some of those questions. So Dave and Tricia both asked 
uh, who hosts idea evaluations? Is that something that comes from campus labs? Is that where that comes from? Yes, it's campus labs. So we worked with campus labs um, to get that set up and to get our online idea evaluations going. And Dave also had some questions about the EBSCO tool, since EBSCO is a service that they also use at Johnson. Mm -hmm. So he was asking uh, first if the instructor view was something that you see in Sakai, or is that something that you actually see in EBSCO when you look at that instructor view that you showed us? Oh, that is in Sakai. It opens inside the window. <clears throat> And he was also wondering uh, whether you all run into licensing issues with EBSCO. Apparently, Johnson has some EBSCO resources, and I believe that the UVA library has these as well, where only a single user can access the resource at one particular time. Do you uh, know anything about that? Is that something that you all have ever run across where licenses are restricted? Um, we haven't run across that. Um, the library actually is who worked with us and then we kind of, they were kind of our coordinator. Um, but that's something I can ask them, but we haven't had any issues with licensing. Um, but I did check in our, I think we have about 12, only a dozen courses using it right now. So um, that could be why too. Put that down. And Dave also had a question about Task Scream uh, and whether or not that has an LTI integration. Is Task Scream something that is integrated into your instance through LTI? Yes, yes it is. That's cool. And it, it doesn't, just as a caution, we use it for only uploading artifacts. Um, we did not choose to use it to do any kind of grading or send feedback back. So we're only using it so that they can get in, cross over and load their artifacts, the students, but we're not returning grades or the instructor's not going into task stream and doing any evaluations and then having that come back either. We're only using it pretty much one way. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Mark has a question about class rosters uh, and idea evaluation. So he's asking, are class rosters being sent to idea evaluations on arrival? So when a student actually accesses and touches the integration, or is that class roster information being sent to the software um, externally? That's actually loaded externally. So when the student comes over, it sees if they're already in there. Because when the student logs in outside of ECN, they use their email address. So we send that over and it matches that up. But we load all that information on the other side through the Campus Labs data management tool. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Dave comments that he's got some more questions about Task Stream, but he's going to PM you about those. So be on the lookout for that. Jennifer. Okay. And be warned to all current and future presenters that sometimes uh, this encourages more collaboration <laughs> and work outside of your presentation, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Hey, Jennifer, this is Tricia. Hi. And thank you for your presentation. It's really awesome. Um, and interestingly enough, um, UVA is evaluating vendors for evaluation. So I wondered how long you guys have been using I, the IDEA integration. Um, we actually did our pilot um, in the our fall semester. Um, we used it for the second eight week courses and the full term courses. Um, so we've only been using it. This will be our first semester. We're going to run it for everything from start to finish. Awesome. Interesting. I'll be interested to hear how it goes. <laughs> yeah. And they've been very good to work with um, their technical team um, as far as getting our files loaded. And we're actually working on automating that process now. And then this is the first semester we're using the LTI because in the fall we didn't get that far. We were working on some other side. So. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. You're welcome. And Mark uh, has another question in the chat about whether students gain access to evaluations primarily via uh, LTI uh, or their course sites or through email or through both. Um, is that something uh, that you might be able to speak to a little bit, Jennifer? Yes, they do it through both. Um, 
Uh, the person who manages that tool is our uh, Dean of Instructional, Dean of Assessment and Instructional Effectiveness. And she uh, sends out, has sets up timing for those emails. So the first group started February 5th, which was Monday. So the students got an email and they could click on a link and go straight over to it. Um, if you want them to do them in class, uh, and they can do them on their mobile device or on a computer. So if you happen to be in a lab, uh, instructors can also give them a direct link or in our online courses, they actually um, can direct them right to it. And they have to, the instructors need to add it to their online course. We don't have it pushed out. Um, none of these tools are automatic. So we make sure that instructors know this is available to you and you can add it through the manage tools on the site info. Gotcha. That's really interesting. I like that there are a lot of different options and a lot of different potential formats for students to be able to complete their evaluations. Mobile sounds like a really interesting option and a good way to get everybody to do it right there in the classroom. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And they usually always have a phone. So if they're okay with doing that, they can. And Sean uh, makes a comment here in the chat that they've been using uh, course evaluations and I have it integrated into the home tool menu so that everyone has access without going into a course. Uh, it will only work if the account is on the course evaluation system. And Sean, I think that's somewhat similar to what we're doing currently at UVA. As Tricia mentioned, we're kind of moving away from the homegrown solution that we have currently for course evaluations. But what we have right now is accessed uh, through home. Oh, that's that's interesting. I'll have to look at that too. And Mark also comments he has many more questions, but doesn't want to monopolize the thread. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Mark. <laughs> Although I'm sure those questions are great. Um, and Jennifer, maybe if you would be willing to post your email in the chat uh, sure. at the end of the presentation, so that folks could reach out to you and contact you offline if they have questions, sure. that would be sure. great. And I also had just a general question, Jennifer, about uh, the possibility of doing one-off tools. So tools added maybe for a particular instructor or a particular course. You know, you mentioned that most of your integrations were global such that everybody at Walsh could access and use those tools. But have you ever gotten a request from a particular instructor and just added something for that particular instructor? And if you have done that, how did that work for you all? Did you like that? Or is that something maybe that you wouldn't do again? Um, that's actually what I do for the nursing, the Elsevier videos. There's usually two or three sections of the same course. And so I have to go in and put the site ID for each one um, so that it will show up for them. Um, I don't like to do it because it's you have to kind of manage it. So every semester, because the site ID will change. So maybe in the spring, they have a different, um, we call them course number that goes with it. So it's nursing 614, course number 12345. And then maybe the next time it's taught, it's course number 34567. Um, so I found I have to actually go in and change that every time. Um, so I don't, really like to do that. I usually test them globally and then I'll restrict them just because it's easier to have it available. Plus I can get to it from my, um, a couple of my test instances. I have a couple different classes I use for testing and it makes it a little bit easier as well. But you can do it. So if you got a one off and it was one class, you can do that. I just, I don't like to, and I've only had the one request, which was for nursing. So Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was really asking because we get occasional requests from individual instructors, for example, folks who teach in UVA's continuing in professional studies program, and mm -hmm. they might have heard about a particular tool, or they might have had access to a particular tool that was made available by a publisher, and so they're interested in that, but we don't necessarily have a university-wide license for it, and mm -hmm. so... I was just wondering uh, how you guys had approached that. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave also asks in the chat uh, whether the duplicate site option or the import from site option works for LTI tools. Uh, Jennifer, is that something that you have played around with? Have you used either the duplicate site or import from site option for these? 
for the one class I mentioned, he uses the EBSCO reading list a lot. Um, every term we import it, it seems that we have to add that back in and it picks it up. So he doesn't have to make to redo his list, but it's like he has to re-add the tool. Um, I have not tried it in 11 yet because he was already set up and ready to go. So for, um, I think that class is being taught again later this spring. So I may try it again and see if in 11 it pulls them over better. Um, but that's the only class that we've had that where we need them to copy over. And then we had a class in communications that uses the Who Knew It Atomic Learning and he had to re-add them, and that was in 10. So I haven't had any yet in 11, so I can let you know. Sounds good, thank you. We've got just a couple more minutes here. Any other discussion or questions for Jennifer? This has been a great presentation with a lot of discussion. So that's been really great. Thanks to everybody. And Dave is asking uh, whether you have a way or a specific method for faculty to request or uh, request access to other LTI tools. Is there some kind of formal process that you all have developed for that, Jennifer, or is that just something where they might just contact you via email? Um, they usually contact myself or our director of e-learning by email. Um, most of our tools are um, university-wide, so we usually, if we're using something and it seems appropriate, we'll just ask the vendor. Like IDEA, uh, when we were putting that together, I just asked them, do you have a LTI integration? And he said, oh, yeah. So... Um, that's how, if it's something that I'm helping implement for a group or for the university, I always ask myself, or if they have a tool like Perusal was a particular instructor wanted that. So she um, emailed me and we worked through that. And in case folks haven't seen that, Jennifer has posted her email address in the chat. So feel free to grab that um, and contact her if you've got additional questions, but don't want to monopolize the last couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and no apologies necessary, Dave. Yeah, no apologies, Dave. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer, I have one general question about where you see the future of this going for integrations at Walsh. Are there other integrations that are on your radar right now, things that you're looking at to add going forward? You mentioned just since November, you've added a couple more tools. Are there other things that are on your radar or are you happy with where you are right now? Um, we're actually good right now. We don't have any new um, requests or projects that we're working on that would be suitable for ECN. So right now I think we're okay. Um, I like to work on kind of fine tuning these a little bit. Like I said, the who knew it, the grading tool is a little weird. So I want to figure out better how that work, how that is working so that we can let instructors know uh, if they are using it. Like I said, I, I must be the first person because no one's ever said they don't show up in the, in the grade book. And I found that out this semester. So, um, so I'm kind of going to work a little bit on that, but we don't have any um, enterprise applications that would be appropriate yet. And I haven't had any other instructors request things. And have you heard good general feedback from instructors and students about this? I definitely agree from an educational perspective and from an instructional design perspective, it's so much better to have everything kind of grouped in a one-stop shop so that students don't have to bounce around from site to site or from system to system. Have you gotten some feedback from instructors and students about this? Because I assume it's really positive. Yes. I mean, the, the one that got the most feedback was task stream when we got that in and working because that one was really... Um, like I said, the students had to go to a different site. You may or may not have a different login. And this way, I think the courses were getting better artifacts loaded because students will just say, I can't do it. I'm done. Um, but this is working a lot better 
uh, for us. And I think it'll help when we're collecting artifacts for assessment and for any of the accreditation from the different um, schools as well. That probably received the most positive. And I think the course evaluations will once they're used through the semester. I think that will be another one that will get a big positive impact. What were you all using for course evaluations previously? You may have mentioned that and I may have missed it, but what were you guys using previously before you moved to this solution? We are actually using IDEA, but we were using the paper version. Okay. Um, and only our, there's a small um, group of online programs that were using um, an online version, but it was separate. So now we've pulled all that in and we're just using online evaluations for everything. We don't use the paper anymore. <laughs> gotcha. And one final question from Dave, uh, the artifacts that you were talking about in task screen, Jennifer, are those for portfolios or what are those artifacts for? Um, most of them are for evaluation and assessment. Um, the, I, you saw the COM 475, that's actually one the communications program does a capstone and they actually use it for portfolios. Um, but all of the other programs in there, which is um, education, counseling and human development, um, our general education program, and then now our theology majors, um, they are actually using it to uh, load up artifacts and then they assess them anonymously, some of them. Some of them assess them and grade them in there like education. So most of those are for accreditation. So when we get, um, when they come to do the accreditation and review, they always want everything in one place. So we're starting to get more programs and they that way they like it, they can log in. Here's all of our um, artifacts we've used. Here's all of our reports, everything's all together. So we're using them not for portfolios, mostly for our assessment program. Gotcha. <laughs> And that's a great way to go out, Dave. He's so glad you asked that <laughs> question because it's very cool and slick. I love that. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>So we're getting close to the end of our time together today. So I just want to make a couple of very brief notes about upcoming sessions. Uh, so just a reminder, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning of our meeting today, but our next meeting will be Wednesday, February the 21st. So two weeks from today, uh, Louisa Lee and Julian Sharp from Marist and Jolie Tingen from Duke are going to do a session for us on how they have utilized the Atlas program to innovate teaching and learning at their institutions. And they're also going to talk about how that program can be used to innovate throughout the Aperio community and talk a little bit about uh, the application process there and have some time for some Q&A. And then on Wednesday, March the 7th, Charles Bristow from Illinois State and some other folks, I assume, will be talking about uh, functional issues with Gradebook NG. So those of you who are on the Sakai user and some other lists may have noticed some traffic in the last few weeks about Gradebook NG and various feedback from instructors and from administrators about how that tool has been performing for them thus far. And so Charles has very graciously volunteered to kind of lead a session and give a presentation on some of the things that they have noticed at Illinois State, uh, how they've addressed those and how they might plan uh, to address some of those going forward. So those are our next two sessions on Wednesday, February the 21st and Wednesday, March 7th. And we hope uh, to see everybody there for those sessions. And we see uh, a comment here from Lucy in the chat. Thanks, Jennifer, for sharing your work. It's really interesting seeing what tools others are using and integrating into Sakai. I definitely agree. Uh, this was a great presentation, a great opportunity to see, you know, real tools in a real instance doing real work. And that just makes everything uh, so much more real when you're trying to understand exactly the kinds of things that Sakai is capable of doing and the flexibility that it can offer. So thank you again so much, Jennifer, for taking the time to let us under the hood and show <laughs> us uh, what's going on at Walsh. Well, thanks. It was great. So if anyone else has other questions or comments, you know, please send them to me and we can talk about it 
as well. I, I Like I said, my biggest thing is I'm not a programmer. We don't have access to our server, and it's just a nice way to get stuff up and running pretty quickly. And working with the vendors has been very pleasant. I've had no problems with that either, so that always makes it nice too. And that's another great thing that I hope we can make more readily available about Sakai is the fact that people with little or no development experience like yourself, like me, um, <laughs> you know, can be interested in tools and uh, can work with people to make those tools available, uh, even without that back end uh, experience or skill. So that's really cool. Not that back end experience or skill is not <laughs> cool. For those of you who have it, it is a great thing. But for those of us who are neophytes, this is also cool. <laughs> so thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and sign off for today. But we look forward to seeing you right back here in two weeks uh, with Louisa and Julian and Jolie to talk a little bit about Atlas. So thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next time.